Adar's real identity as Uruk explored from the rings of power. Hi, this is Simon Candlish, and welcome to Marvelous Videos. The sixth episode from the Rings of Power stirred things up in more ways than one. All those who were starting to think that the show was moving a bit too slowly suddenly had to sit back and take notice because the episode was so eventful and action-packed. One of the major revelations in the episode was about a mysterious new character that was previously unheard of in Tolkien's lore, Adar. The showrunners maintained secrecy about the real identity of Adar describing him just as a leader of the Orcs, whom they loved and fear as a father figure. This episode shed some light on his identity as an Uruk and squashed a few rumors about him being Sauron. In this video, we will bring you everything about Uruks and their origins, and also put things into perspective in terms of the show. Be warned about a few spoilers ahead. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, and let's begin. <laughs> Understanding Uruks and their origins. In order to have a better understanding of how the Uruk originated, we have to go back to the creation of orcs. The first Dark Lord Morgoth captured a few unfortunate elves in the first age of Middle-earth, and years of unspeakable torture turned them into orcs. This was intended as an insult to elves, but Morgoth was finally defeated, and his second-in-command, Sauron, took over the reign. The allegiance of the orcs shifted to him, and with time, they kept multiplying to become a numerically superior force. They became one of the most commonly found soldiers fighting for the Dark Forces, and their presence has led to further classifications among their ranks. Tolkien used the term Orc from a word that roughly translates to Goblin, and this made many think that they were essentially the same. However, Tolkien did not clarify about the creation of the Uruk and the Urukai, which were basically a stronger form of the Orcs. We also don't get clear answers about the need for the creation of such entities when the Dark Forces already had plenty of fighters. If you go by the movie adaptions of The Lord of the Rings, you'll observe that there have been a few rather imaginative interpretations of Tolkien's works in this regard, just to make the difference between Orcs and Uruk stand out. Even though the Orcs had a great numerical advantage, the Urukai was much larger and stronger than the Orcs. Clearly, they were better fighters and had a far deadlier adversary than the Orcs in the battlefield. At this point, you're probably starting to wonder how we are taking the name Uruk and Urukai in the same breath. Well, your doubts are reasonable enough because most people tend to forget that Urukai was actually bred by Saruman, which later in the Third Age to fight for Sauron in the War of the Ring. There have been subtle hints that the creation of Urukai was possible after breeding men and orcs because it tended to root out the general weakness that the orcs had to deal with. If you go by Peter Jackson's trilogy, the orcs actually take part in a great conspiracy with Saruman and help in the creation of the Urukai. And these new soldiers were clearly meant to add muscle to the force. Immediately after their creation, it becomes abundantly clear that the Urukai possess a greater threat than the orcs ever posed. Sauron's forces improved drastically, and it also helped the director to add a certain perspective regarding the advanced new threat that he had to deal with. We all know that for the narrative to be interesting in a fancy world, as the Lord of the Rings, the evil forces must always evolve and keep on challenging the good. Just to get the main difference between Uruk and Uruk High out in the open, the Uruks were the ones who emerged from Mordor and caused massive destruction under the service of Barad-dûr. Urukai emerged much later, bred accordingly to a plan by the notorious Saruman the White in the Third Age. They were faster, stronger, smarter, and larger than the regular orcs, which highlighted their superiority. The Urukai could travel or fight tirelessly, and their freakish strength was a league apart from the usual orcs. In the books, they have often been described with a heavy build, and it seemed like, without violence, they were in some kind of pain. The Urukai would grimace and snarl until they caused some bloodshed, which almost provided them some sort of relief. 
Their crushing weight did affect their swift reflexes, but their crude moves in a battle hardly ever demanded any. They could smash and defeat the attacking weapon, and there were times when they didn't even try to defend themselves, depending solely on their armor and brute strength. They played a major part in the War of the Ring, and we don't see them in the Rings of Power because the time period simply doesn't match. Composition of the Uruk Army, the Berserker Uruks. The Uruk Army comprised of some unusual elements beside the usual swordsmen, crossbowmen, pikemen, sappers, and scouts. This special force was called Berserkers, who were much larger and a lot more violent than General Uruks. They would shave their heads and fill up their helmets with human blood. When they wore these helmets into battle, the blood would trickle down their back and the scent would send them into a killing frenzy. Their insane moment of Berserker rage probably got them the name, and their double-bent swords were among the most terrifying weapons in the battlefield. The Berserkers were so strong that they could take the head off a human with one clean strike, and they used the double spikes on the end of their weapons to disembowel horses. Even the leather armor of the enemy was not a deterrent factor for these fierce fighters, and they were a force to reckon with. However, all said and done about the weapons used by the Uruks, they were still not at par with the level of craftsmanship displayed by humans, dwarves, or elves. The weapons, although effective, still ended up being crude and paled in comparison to the quality of the opponent's weapons. Classification of Uruks, exploring the various types. The classification of Uruks can be a tricky business because they can really be distinguished from various perspectives. For instance, going by their origins, you can broadly classify them into Isengard Uruks and Mordor Uruks. The former were created by Saruman Magic, a knowledge of some ancient alchemy, a trick that he probably learned from Sauron himself during his years of loyal service to the Dark Lord. They were almost animalistic and savages during the events of the War of the Ring, and they made up a major portion of Saruman's army. The Isengard Uruks would roar aloud like vicious large cats, and some of them were given a major responsibility to bring hobbits and Frodo alive. Some important members, such as Lurtz, Ugluk, Lugdush, and Mauher were given the responsibility. The Mordor Uruks were created by Sauron during the events of the Third Age, the Dark Lord himself engineered the creation of this supreme force with the help of a group of orcs, and even seemed to resort to some mysterious alchemy for the creation of the Uruks. These Uruks had sharper features, and they were tasked with the destruction of the city of Osgiliath. The classifications, however, do not just end here, because the Uruks could also be classified depending on their fighting style or the type of armament they used. For instance, the Archer Uruks were comparatively scrawnier than the others, and they held fort on higher ground to be safe from the range of the attackers. Of course, they shadow their weaker physique with their skills of aiming perfectly and striking the enemy from a great distance. The Warrior Uruks were among the most common types, and their sizes range from well-built soldiers to the weaker ones. Usually, they are seen fighting with a one-handed weapon, which could be a club or a hammer or a sword. There have also been instances where the warrior Uruks carried a weapon that could be thrown at the enemy. We have already explored the unique Berserker Uruks and there are the Defender Uruks who carry strong and large shields to block attacks from the front. They also use traditional spears to reach out to the enemy from behind the protection of the shields while keeping a safe distance. Like the warrior Uruks, they are also a fairly common sight in the Uruk ranks. Meanwhile, the hunter Uruks are capable of throwing their spears at the enemy and they are often tasked with the crucial challenge of dealing with the beasts. They carry a lot of spears and javelins on their backs, and in spite of their smaller stature, they are a formidable part of the Uruk army. Just like the archer Uruks, the hunter Uruks are also quite incapable of withstanding too much damage, and they must be positioned carefully behind the others. There are still others like the executioners, who are basically the guardians of the Uruk society to protect against any kind of lawlessness 
in their twisted societal structure. It is very easy for Yuriks to enter a vicious cycle of murder and slaughter, even among themselves, if there aren't any checks on their actions. In such moments, the executioner is called to settle disputes, and when it is serious for them to arrive, one can be sure of a few heads rolling. Another very important type of Yurik is the Beast Master, who learn to tame or slaughter the wild beasts of Mordor. They are hunters and skilled in the art of handling wild beasts, which becomes extremely important when you consider the fact that a place like Mordor requires domination over these creatures. Slaver Yuriks simply manage the transportation and processes involved with captured humans, and Sawbones are basically the doctors of the Yurik society. With enough knowledge to fix the injured and sick, patching up basic wounds sustained in battle. <laughs> Finally, Ratbag is war chief! Understanding the hierarchy in the Yurik society. The Uruk Society is known to follow a clearly demarcated line of hierarchy, and this also brings about a classification of the Uruks based on the ranks that they hold. Also, it needs to be understood here that the hierarchy observed here is, is not the kind you see in the civilized world, and even the powerful have to always be on guard to protect their position. For example, the war chiefs are among the most elite Uruks, and they have earned their way to their position after a lot of violence and bloodshed. However, their position is still threatened by others who might pose a challenge. The war chiefs surround themselves with bodyguards, and even then, they have to be on guard for an attack from his own protectors. They only make their presence felt when they are challenged to a duel, refusing, which is perceived as an act of weakness, that dethrones them. Next in rank would be the captains, who often get promoted up the order to become a war chief. The captain is usually responsible to oversee the management of Sauron's army, and they also take care of several other crucial elements, like battle plans and other projects. Just like the war chiefs, even the position of a captain is not secure, and they must either move up or down the ladder depending on their capabilities. Soldiers don't hold a special place in Yurik society, even though they are so important when it comes to the composition of the force. They are opportunists who will kill a captain to take up the position, but such opportunities are few. Neils are at the bottom of the Uruk hierarchy, treated as disposable by the others and used simply for their eternal lust and amusement. Even the Neil's babies are still born, and they have no chance of promoting themselves up the food chain. The difference between Saruman's Uruks and those created by Sauron. The books are very clear about explaining that Saruman simply replicated the methods successfully tried out by Sauron. In Peter Jackson's trilogy, Saruman seemed to believe that the Uruks were his own inventions. But when we see Sauron's Uruks, in the return of the king, they clearly appear rougher and tougher. However, the scene where Saruman's Urukai is shown to be created from a membrane-like gooey substance under the Isengard stands out as one of the most terrifying and disgusting moments. Coming back to the Rings of Power, Adar refers to himself and those like him to be Uruks, not Urukai, but Uruks, keeping in line with the timeline we just discussed. In the show, they make a clear demarcation between Uruks and Urukai. How the sixth episode shapes the character. Firstly, this is the most we've seen of Adar, and it is safe to say that he is now becoming a fan favorite by now, in spite of being a negative character. The episode explores the finesse in the character and the sheer dedication to his cause that makes him stop at nothing. The sixth episode of The Rings of Power, titled Udun, is basically an hour-long battle sequence with more stuff happening around than the previous episodes put together. Arendir has rallied the villagers with the support of Bronwyn, and they are up against the formidable force of the Orcs, led by Adar. However, it soon becomes clear that a stronger and larger army is not enough to win battles, especially when it comes to a charging fortress in Middle-earth. Saruman learned this during the events of the Two Towers, and this time, it becomes a lesson for Adar. The Orc leader gathers his troops with an inspirational speech about their promised freedom, and the large army of Orcs charges the gates of the tower on Osrith with great enthusiasm. But their enthusiasm soon turns into despair when they realize that they've been lured into an elaborate trap set by Arendir. 
They find out that the tower has been abandoned, and Arandir is the only one present to ensure the destruction of the orcs with a few well-aimed arrows and quick maneuvers. The booby-trapped tower wipes out a large part of Adar's forces, but the remaining orcs are still outnumbering the villagers. The victory for Arandir and Bronwyn is short-lived, because they have to plan once again to outsmart the orc army. They gather in a village nearby and prepare for the inevitable second round with their meager resources. We get to see the genius strategies of Arandir and his inspirational speeches echo a winning sentiment through the hearts of the people. Initially, it looks like Arandir and his men are able to spring another surprise on the orc forces, but we soon realize that Adar is not a strategic dummy himself. After a hard-fought battle, Arandir and Bronwyn discover much to their shock that the orc army that attacked them had a majority of the villagers who chose to accept Adar's previous offer of peace. The orcs lurking around now spring a surprise attack and even the last stronghold is breached as Arandir and an injured Bronwyn are cornered. In walks Adar, still calm and composed, simply demanding to know the location of the magical dagger that Bronwyn's son Theo found before. He orders innocents to be killed till they spill the hidden location and eventually Theo gives in to threats when Adar threatens to kill his mother. However, there is one major surprise that changes the course of events drastically. Just as you start thinking that it's all over and Adar has a special dagger that belonged to Sauron, you can hear a rumble which signifies the arrival of Galadriel, Halbrand and several Numenarian soldiers who are trained enough to lead a cavalry charge and slaughter the Orc army. Adar tries to escape with the dagger, but Galadriel is in pursuit, with Halbrand following closely. Finally, Halbrand catches up with the Orc leader and the dagger is retrieved while he is taken prisoner because Galadriel wants him alive. I killed Sauron. I do not believe you. Adar's real origin story spilled during interrogation. What follows next is an intense interrogation scene where Galadriel speaks to Adar to know more about Sauron and his whereabouts. Adar reveals his actual identity and we learn that he is a son of the Dark, which happens to be one of the first orcs ever. This was originally an elf kidnapped by Morgoth and then corrupted by his evil powers. Galadriel mentions that she has heard about elves taken by Morgoth as a child and it is safe to assume that Adar dates back to an earlier era than Galadriel herself who has led a very long life. These elves were tortured and twisted into their new form, and these became the first orcs of the Moriondor. Adar states that he prefers to be called Uruk, and the disgust on Galadriel's face is there for all to see. When Adar claims that his children, the orcs, have just as much right to exist freely as the other creations, Galadriel terms them as a crude joke on creations. She simply despises the existence of the orcs, and she promises Adar that she will keep him alive until she kills the last of his kind. She wants him to die after knowing that his entire orc clan has been eliminated. However, it is a little too boastful too early. The audiences are soon shocked with yet another twist, which reveals that the actual dagger was taken by Waldrek, another deserter villager who sided with Adar before. He replaced the dagger with a simple axe deceived Galadriel and Holbrand, and now he is seen plunging it into a rock that looks like some puzzle. It soon sets off a chain of disastrous events, and water gushes through the underground passages, and the sky turns black with a dangerous volcanic eruption in the nearby mountain. This is where the true meaning of the title can be understood. Udun is basically the Valley of Mordor that has seen a lot of volcanic activity, and now the viewers will know that the mountain seen erupting is Mount Doom. The episode ends on a cliffhanger, but Adar's identity has certainly been put to rest, at least for the time being. Not only is it clear that he is not Sauron, but it is also evident that he harbors a strong hate for Sauron because the evil lord sacrificed the orcs for his selfish cause. Why do the orcs call you father? Is Adar an orc or an elf? 
This is the question that cropped up during the events of the sixth episode, and even his previous appearances raised this doubt among the fans. Adar displayed several elf-like characteristics. He has lived for thousands of years. He is not susceptible to sunlight, like the orcs are, and his appearance closely resembles an elf. On the other hand, Adar is regarded as a father figure by the orcs, and his sole purpose in life seems to be the well-being of these disgusting beasts. Naturally, we start to wonder whether Adar is an orc or an elf. The real answer to the question should be that he is neither anatomically. He revealed that he loves to address himself as Uruk, but the father figure is not similar to the orcs that we see around him. It might be the case that the appearance of the orc started to take an animalistic turn, and since he was one of the first orcs ever, his appearance retains more elf features. Adar truly is a unique being, where his consciousness and thinking ability are akin to the elves, while his loyalties lie with the orcs. How long did he serve Morgoth? Adar has been a loyal servant for Morgoth, but he did not voluntarily join the services. It can be assumed that during his initial stages of free living, he was forcefully taken by Morgoth and changed into something twisted and evil. If you remember the first episode, Galadriel's childhood was around the years of the trees, and if she heard stories about something existing as a child, it can be said with certainty that Adar's existed for a long time before Galadriel's existence. We are curious to learn more about the role of Adar during the Great War against Morgoth, but it becomes abundantly clear with Adar admitting certain things about his past that he was one of the earliest elves who were taken by Morgoth. The original Uruks and the later Orcs. We have already spoken about how someone like Adar was transformed into an Uruk. It required years of captivity and extreme torture to break the entire foundation of elf consciousness down. Morgoth used this as his tool to insult the creation of Uru Luvata, who favoured the elves among all his creations. The original Uruks were used to breed the latter orc races that appeared, and this also explains the difference in the appearance of Adar and the orc soldiers we see around him. Where's Sauron? Adar states the reason behind his hate for Sauron. This was another big moment in the show, especially because some fan theories were starting to believe that Adar could be Sauron himself. Others felt there was a genuine chance of Adar being one of Sauron's main soldiers, but even that was proven wrong. It is true that Adar was making the orcs dig through the tunnels to find the hidden sword hilt that belonged to Sauron, but he was not taking orders from the Dark Lord. He simply wanted the orcs to live freely in a kingdom of darkness because his past experience taught him that other Dark Lords have a tendency to treat his kind as disposable to suit their personal interests. During Galadriel's interrogation, Adar claims to have killed Sauron, and his grudge probably stemmed from the fact that Sauron sacrificed thousands of orcs for his desire to rule over Middle-earth. Instead of being slaves like always, Adar dreamed of a new kind of freedom for his orc children and even as a negative character, that has to be a commendable thought. It is heartening to see the Rings of Power try to give a fresh dimension to the whole story of the Uruks. Even though we have bits and pieces of information from Tolkien's lore and previous movies, there is still a lot of room to explore further in this regard, and we are curious to learn how the narrative will take it up. Do let us know in the comments below about your thoughts on the Uruks and Adar being one of them. Also feel free to hit us with your next requests about topics from Lord of the Rings universe that you want us to explore next. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone. How are you?